All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Samuel? We're going to be working our way through 2 Samuel tonight. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the book of 1 Samuel, and there were three main characters, and those characters were Samuel, who was an obedient prophet, and Saul, who was a sinful king, and David, who was a faithful future king. 2 Samuel begins with the reign of David and takes us forward 40 years. And uh, 1 Kings, which follows 2 Samuel, is pretty much the starts with the reign of Solomon. But in the same way that 1 Samuel is the book in Scripture which documents the story of Israel under their own self-government, 2 Samuel is the first example of Israel living under the rule of a good king. So let's take a look at 2 Samuel and see where we can go. We want to remind ourselves of the timeline that we're working with here. This is very important. Um, About 1100 BC is where we are on the timeline. Samuel himself was born probably about 1105. About 50 years later, Saul becomes king, and he reigns for 42 years until 1011, where he dies and David becomes king. And then David rules for 40 years until 971, and he dies. Solomon rules for another 40 years, at which point Israel becomes divided into the northern and the southern kingdom. Where we are at the end of 1 Samuel is that uh, Saul was at the end of his reign, and he was performing very badly in his role as the king. God had departed from Saul, and he'd moved on from Saul, and Saul's days were numbered, and Saul knew it. Uh, the, The book of 1 Samuel ends with the Philistines soundly defeating Israel. Saul and Jonathan are both dead. Saul lost his life on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines, they took Saul's body and they cut off his head and they paraded his body throughout Philistia. And this was one of the most humiliating defeats that Israel had experienced. A pagan nation was rejoicing over the weakness of God's people. There was one main character in 2 Samuel, and that's David. And what we're going to see tonight is that David had an awful lot of success as king. But we'll also see that there was turmoil, and there was an awful lot of turmoil. And that turmoil is due almost entirely to David's sin. We're going to see the success pretty much in the first 10 chapters of the book, and then we're going to see the consequences of that uh, David's sin in the next 10 chapters. But the best way to do that is to look at the character qualities that David exhibited. So tonight we're going to be looking at an overview of the character qualities that King David put on display in three areas. We're going to look at those character qualities that he put on display in his success as king. We're going to look at the character qualities that he put on display in his sin. And then we're going to look at the character qualities that he put on display in his repentance. David was a good king. He was probably Israel's best king. Um, Let's talk for a minute about what it is that makes for a good king. What does make for a good king? Well, a good king is one who is humble, and he understands that his authority is from God, and that he'll answer to God for the ways in which he wields the authority that God gave to him. When he succeeds in war, he doesn't take the credit to himself. And when his country prospers, he's not a burden to his people. He doesn't impose an exorbitant tax to support a lifestyle. He's a good king. He's a humble king. But to be a good king, you need to be a holy king. David actually was an example to his people of how to live a life that's separate from sin. So a good king is a humble king, and he's a holy king, and he's an obedient king. And there's a lot of overlap in these things. We're going to see them tonight. He's exemplary under God's authority so that his people know how to do the same thing. They watch their king obey God so they know how to obey God but he's also just. A lot of times in Israel, the king would decide cases. And a just king doesn't use his own wisdom. He uses the wisdom of scripture to decide those cases. A king is faithful. He keeps his own commitments because he knows that God is faithful to keep his commitments. So you see all of these things that are true about a king. He's humble, he's obedient, he's just, he's faithful. But above all else, he needs to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what gives him the wisdom that he needs to rule rightly as king. 
His fear of the Lord does that for him. And the king who has this wisdom knows how to respond to the issues that he will have to navigate as king, leading his country. Uh, so we're going to walk through the first 10 chapters, and as we do that, we will try to notice the God-honoring attributes that are true about David, the characteristics that he puts on display in his success. And we don't want to lose track of God's hand in all of this. We're seeing that God is working. And so we'll, when we get to chapter 7, we'll see the covenant that God makes with David. Uh, but tonight, the focus is going to be on David himself and what he puts on display in his success, in his sin, and in his repentance. So when we get to chapter 1, the story in chapter 1 is one of Saul's death and how that's being announced to David. An Amalekite man relates to David how Saul and Jonathan are now dead. They lost their lives in the battle on Mount Gilboa to the Philistines. If you drop down to verses 17 through 27 of chapter 1, you'll see David doing something that's pretty interesting. He chants a lament for Saul and for David. And we know from 1 Samuel that, that Saul had a, David had a great relationship with Jonathan. So you would expect a lament for Jonathan. This is my good friend, my dear friend, a man with whom I made a personal covenant. But he also laments Saul. And you see that in verse 24. He says, O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who puts ornament of gold on your apparel. Here we see the fear of the Lord in David. The fear of the Lord gives David a right view of the Lord's anointed. He knew that Saul was the king, the anointed king. Even though Saul was his enemy, he knew that he needed to fear the one that God put in that office. And that's going to serve him well as he navigates his own reign. As we move out of chapter 1 into chapter 2, we begin to see the transition into David's reign. And the summary here in chapter 2 is you begin to see evidence of God's favor on David to be the next king. Drop down to verse 4, the men of Judah anoint David to be king. And it's important that we understand that he's king just over Judah, not of the remaining tribes in Israel. And David would reign as king over Judah for seven years in Hebron. And then this man Abner comes into view in verse 8, verse 8 through 11. Abner was the commander of Saul's army, what was left of Saul's army after they got annihilated by the Philistines. And Saul's son, Ishbosheth. Uh, was then appointed by Abner to be the king over all of Israel. So we see that happening in verses 8 through 11. But what this does is this sets up the situation that will prove to all of Israel that God had chosen David to be the next king and that his blessing was on David. And you see that in verses 12 through 17. Abner proposes a duel. There was an awful lot of tension between the army of Saul, which is now Ishbosheth's army, and David and his men. And there was tension and there was long war between them. So Abner proposes a duel. And it's a duel by the pool of Gilboa. And David's men killed Abner's men. They had a dramatic victory there. And if you drop down to verses 30 through 32, there's a death tally that's given to us there. The men of David suffered 19 casualties. And Abner's men, there were 360 casualties. So you have the men from the army, and you have the men of David. And for every one of David's men that were lost, there were 30 men of Abner's that were lost. That tells you a little bit about God's blessing on David. He'd given him men with extraordinary ability. Move on to chapter 3, and we see that Abner now aligns himself with David. And then he's murdered by Joab. Joab is um, one of these men who you'll see him put together with two other men, Abishai and Asahel, these were the sons of Zeruiah, and Zeruiah was actually David's sister. And so what you see in Joab is a propensity towards violence, and, and this is the first instance of it. And there's a, a long war between David and, and uh, in Israel, uh, Judah and Israel. And Joab starts, and he, he actually murders Abner in this. And uh, Abner aligns himself with David, and then he's murdered by Joab. And you see increasingly, it becomes increasingly clear that David himself will prevail here. And what you see in verses 2 through 5 is something that's very interesting. There's this building momentum of David becoming uh, more and more equipped, more and more successful, more and more able by God. And then God inserts for four verses a record of the, the number of children that were born to David in the seven years that he was king in Hebron. And you'll see there that six sons are listed, and he had those six sons by six different women. And on one hand, you look at this and you see, well, this is God's blessing. 
Uh, if God has plans to establish a throne for David, well, then he's going to give him sons from which he will draw one of them and put them on that throne. But on the other hand, because all these sons were born from different women, David was setting a stage. And what he was setting a stage for was some violent conflict that was going to establish in his own household. And that's a pattern with David. And so Joab is the leader of David's forces. You could almost call him David's general, but David doesn't really have an army yet, but he has a lot of very, very capable men that are following him. So Abner transfers his loyalty to David, and he works with the leadership of Benjamin and Israel for David to become king over all of Israel. He asked permission from David to go and uh, work things out with the leadership of his country, and Joab murders Abner in that. This is another example of the violence that will just accompany David in his reign all throughout. So Abner is now dead. The general, the commander of the army of Israel is now dead. And we move to chapter 4, and what we see God doing is God is removing the very last rival that David has for being on the throne in Israel, all of Israel, not just the tribe of Judah, but all 12 tribes. So Ishbosheth again, is the son of Saul, and he loses courage when he learns that Abner is now dead. We see that in verses 1 through 3. And then there are two men who murder Ishbosheth, and they bring his head to David at Hebron. And here again is where you see the response of David, and it shows that David has a fear for the Lord. These two men, again, they murdered um, Ishbosheth, And so David, in verses 9 through 12, commands his young men to kill the two men, and they do so, and they put it on their dead bodies on public display. Verse 12, David commanded the young men, and they killed them and cut off their hands and feet and hung them up beside the pool in Hebron. Here we see the fear of the Lord. Even though Ishbosheth was somewhat of a threat to David, David didn't rejoice under the unjust murder of his opponent or that man. And David understood Scripture. He understood Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. Thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. David knew God's word. He knew what God's word demanded of him, and he carried that out. So he feared the Lord, and he lived faithfully under God's word. But when we move to chapter 5, we see something that's really interesting here. We see the beginning of a vast military success for David. God is giving David a great deal of success under united Israel, not just as the king of Hebron regionally, but, but the whole nation. And we get to verses 1 through 5. David makes a covenant with the elders of Israel, and the elders of Israel anoint David as king over all of Israel. But the Jebusites are in Jerusalem, so David goes in, conquers them, he takes them, and he names the city the city of David. And this indicates that David knows that he's now the king over all of the land. And then in verses 11 and 12, we see Hiram come into place. Hiram is a king of Tyre, and he builds a house for David in Jerusalem, and God is demonstrating to David that he is exalting David in the eyes of his neighboring kings. That's another significant step. We see God's blessing here. And then you see another record here in verses 13 through 16, 11 kids fathered by David in Jerusalem. And again, more kids, they're a blessing. But again, they were born to many different women. And by having children from so many different women, David is again sowing the seeds for a future discord in his household. And we'll see that in the back half of the book. But here is where we see God giving David the upper hand over all of his neighbors, not just within Israel over those who are contending for the throne, but his neighbors. And of course, the first nation that comes into sight is the Philistines. And we remember that they're the ones that were oppressing Israel at the end of Saul's reign. And they'd been a thorn in their side for many years, and they were probably the most prominent opposition to Israel and the, the most significant force at the time. Verses 17 to 21, the Philistines seek out David as soon as they understand that he'd been anointed king over all of Israel. And this is where we see another characteristic of David. David inquired of the Lord as to whether he would deliver the Philistines to him. And God says, yes. And so David defeats the Philistines. The Philistines abandoned their idols, and David's men removed those idols. So one of the characteristics we see here in David is that he's humble. He's had all of this success. He's really moving in a good direction. He's got a lot of momentum behind him, but he inquires of the Lord. But he's also holy. He sees the Philistine idols. He knows exactly what they are, and he gets rid of them. 
We do not need those in our country. I don't want to put those in front of our people. So the Philistines were undeterred. They, they start again in verses 20 through 22 through 25. They're arrayed against David, and David inquires of the Lord again. And the Lord this time gives David specific battle instructions of how to go about defeating them. And David obeys those, and he routed the Philistines. So here's another characteristic of David. We see again that he's humble. He inquires of the Lord. But here we see that he's obedient. He obeys the Lord's instructions. And again, he has a really impressive resume. He's got a lot of victories behind him. The Lord is really with him, but he's humble and he's obedient. And that keeps him from foolishly asserting himself. So the Lord is giving David military success as the king over united Israel. And then we turn to chapter 6, and the, the focus of attention here is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not in Jerusalem at this time, and David wanted it to be in Jerusalem so that everybody could see that God's presence was there. So he takes 30,000 men to move the Ark to the house of Abinadab. The Ark is eventually brought to Jerusalem after some issues. And David is full of joy, so much so that he's singing and he's dancing. And this is much more than a symbolic gesture. This is genuine worship, genuine joy. And the reason why David is overjoyed about this is because God's presence itself, his very presence that God has in his tabernacle, uh, is finally in Jerusalem and in the ark. So there you see holiness on David's part. David had a right understanding of the importance of God's presence for Israel. He didn't think that his people could function separate from God. They needed to be near to God and they needed to worship God. So things continue to go really well. David is building not only a robust military record, but he's building a robust resume of character qualities of a good king. And you get to chapter 7, and you see the Davidic covenant coming into place. This is the covenant that God makes with David. But it's interesting how the chapter starts. David proposes to Nathan that he build a house for the ark, and Nathan affirms that idea. That's a good idea. Let's do that. But the word of the Lord comes to Nathan and corrects Nathan about what he had counseled David to do. And then the Lord gives Nathan very specific instructions what to say to David instead of, let's go build this house for the ark. And this is the occasion where God reveals the covenant to David. And we're going to see that in verses 8 through 16 of chapter 7. And we'll walk through what each one of these things are. These are impressive. This is, again, God's covenant to David. It is God's guarantee to David. David can put his confidence in the Lord. Verse 8, God starts by reminding David how David got to where he is. I am the one who made you ruler. I've been with you thus far, in verse 9. I will give you a great name. I will make Israel a place where they will not be disturbed. I will give Israel rest from their enemies. I will make a house for you. I will raise up a descendant after David and establish his kingdom. Talking about David's offspring, Solomon comes into view here pretty quickly. That man will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. I will correct him when he sins. That's pretty impressive. That's, those are some good guarantees. Any leader would want that. And then in verse 15, he says, My loving kindness shall not depart from him. Up to this point, it involves only things about David, but he says to him, um, on the next page, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne will be established forever. It shall be established forever. This is a certainty. This is something that will happen. So those are God's, that's God's covenant to David. God initiates this covenant. God makes that unilaterally to David. And then you see David's prayer of response. And this tells us an awful lot about David and where he is right then. Verse 18, who am I before you? Here's David with all of these great military accomplishments. Everybody loves him. Everybody's behind him. Who am I before you? You have done this for the sake of your word. David knows it's not about me. It's about God's word. You are great and unique. Verse 23, there is no nation like Israel. God redeemed for himself to make a name for himself. You've established Israel as your people forever. David understands, I'm small, but you have made us your people. You are our God. And why did God do that? In verse 26, so that your name may be magnified forever. Your words are truth. You have promised this good thing to me. 
May it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever. David sees himself as a servant. He sees himself as an instrument in God's hands. He doesn't see himself as his king with his great resume, having all these massive accomplishments and everybody loves him. He sees himself as God's servant. So there's where you see his humility, right there in verse 18. Who am I before you? You see his fear of the Lord. You've done this for the sake of your word. David is not thinking about himself. His thoughts are dominated by God and God's greatness, not his own. You are great and unique. So God is giving David a picture of future success. And we see the fruit of that immediately in chapter 8. You go to chapter 8 and you see the fruit of the Davidic covenant being lived out. And this is probably the front end of the height or the peak of David's military success. It doesn't get much better than this in chapters 8 and 10. In verse 1, David defeats the Philistines. So he's already taken care of them in the past. He gets them again. Verse 2, Moab. Verse 3, Hadadezar, son of Rehab, king of Zobah. 1,700 horsemen, 20,000 soldiers. David defeats the Arameans who came to help them, 22,000 men. He took much spoil from Moab. Verses 9 through 12, Toy, king of Hamath, blesses David for defeating Hadadezar. Verses 13 and 14, David makes another name for himself, a greater name for himself, after killing 18,000 more Arameans. And he puts garrisons in Edom, and the Edomites become servants to David. David is on a roll here, but it is not because of him. It's because God gave him. God is with him. The Lord is with him. You see this in chapter 8, verse 6. And the Lord helped David wherever he went. And David understands this, and he knows this. He is aligned with God's purposes, he knows this. He knows it's not because of his own skill that God is fulfilling the terms that he gave David in his covenant with him. Back in chapter 7, verse 9, I will make David a great name. Everybody knows David. Everybody knows him. Then in chapter 8, verses 15 to 18, you see the account of David's administration in Israel. David has all of this success, so he sets up an administration so he can legislate and rule over his country well. You've got Joab over the army. You've got a listing of the recorders and the priests and the secretary. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. David's sons were chief ministers. David's got an architecture for the leadership of his country. So he's thinking about this. He's not being blind about this. He's doing this well. Verse 15, so David reigned over all of Israel and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. David himself administered the justice which is another one of the character qualities that makes for a good king. He is a just king. They've got this perfect law. They've got a godly man at the head of this country, and he's leading the implementation of that law over his people. He's actually administering the justice there. But with all his success, David had not lost sight of his role as king. Israel had forsaken God as their king. He knows that. He remembers that, that the original design was that God would be their king. It was only just a generation or so before him that Israel rejected God as their king. He knows that. And they wanted a man, and they got a man, and that man was a poor king, and David knew that. And David has the opportunity to show Israel God's mercy by being a good king, and he was a good king. In chapter 9, we see David's faithfulness. When David was friends with Jonathan while Jonathan was still alive, he made a covenant with Jonathan back in 1 Samuel. He said, I will... Uh, Jonathan knew that Jonathan was not going to be the next king. He knew that David was going to be the next king. And David entered into covenant with him and said, I will be kind to your house and your offspring. And you see that in verses 1 through 8. David himself has the initiative. He inquires as to the family of Saul. Is there anybody left that I can use to fulfill my end of this covenant with? And David fulfills that in verses 9 through 13. So you see the faithfulness that makes for a good king. David is, is faithful to his own word because he knows that God is faithful to his word. Nobody would have required this of David. David could have let that one wash away and, and let it go and no one would have figured that out and it would have been just fine. But David knew that he made a covenant and he wanted to show people that the integrity that he had was, was a function of God's integrity so they could look to God and trust God in, in all of God's faithfulness. So in the same way that God was faithful to the covenant that he made with David, David was faithful to the one he made with Jonathan. 
All right, we're going to get to chapter 10, and it's really important that we understand what's taking place in chapter 10. This is the epitome of David's military success. And it's very important for us to understand this well because this sets the setting for what will take place in chapter 11. And we all know what takes place in chapter 11, but understanding what happens in chapter 10 is very, very helpful to this. So David has continued military success. And the events of this success aren't really the issue, but it's the mindset that David had after these events that are so significant. And remember, David has been a humble, godly, obedient, holy king to this point. He's been fearing the Lord. Verses 1 through 5, Nahash the Ammonite had died, and his son uh, mistreated David's men. The king dies, and so the, his son became the king. And so David sent a detachment of men to the son to console him over the death of his father. But the son mistreated David's men because he thought they were spies. In verses 6 through 8, they, they realize what they've done. They see that they've become odious to David. And so what do they do? They realize that they can't handle this on their own, so they go out and they hire the Arameans for war against Israel. So in verses 9 through 14, you see the strategy that's involved. You see the military leadership of Israel figuring out how they're going to go about this. Verses 15 through 19, um, or 9 through 14, you see the results of this. Uh, they defeat the Ammonites and the Arameans together. Israel defeats them together, and those nations flee. They flee. But then in verses 15 through 19, the Arameans consolidate their forces in opposition to David, and look what David does. He kills 700 charioteers and 40,000 horsemen. These are the Arameans. These are the ones that the Ammonites hired. How would you like to be the Ammonites at this point? You see your muscle getting taken out by David. Not very encouraging. You hire these Arameans to help you, and David destroys them. So much so that those Arameans, they fear to help the Aramites, the Ammonites anymore because of David. They might help the Ammonites with somebody else, some other nation, but not against David. And all of this is because the hand of the Lord is with David, and God is proving himself to be faithful in his terms of the covenant that he made with David. So here's David. He's got this excellent military record. He's very esteemed by all of his neighbors. You have God sovereignly presiding over Israel. Israel is his people. And it is led by a humble, holy, obedient, just, faithful king. So let's take a point of application here for a minute. We've gotten to the end of chapter 10. This is the end of the good news in this book. Um, we're going to talk about authority for ourselves. This is really helpful for us to think about. For most of us in, in this room, we have some kind of authority. It might be authority on a larger scale. It might be authority on a very small scale. But think for a minute about the authority that God has given you in your life. Again, it might be small. It might be big. How do you wield that authority? Now, authority is not authority if it's not firm. It has to be firm. Otherwise, it's not authority. But is it like David? Is it humble? Is it holy? Is it obedient? Is it just? Is it faithful? Above all, is it characterized by a fear of the Lord? Or is it difficult for people to function under your authority? Are people fearful of your response when they mess up? Now, for most of us, the first thing that should come to mind when we think about authority is our homes. So for those of us who are dads, whether we've got kids at home or kids out of the house or kids on the other side of the planet, how do you carry that authority? How do you carry the authority in your marriage? What do you rely on most when it's time for correcting and training? If you've got a nice big imposing presence and a nice big imposing voice, do you use that? Or you use the role that God gave you? Moms, what does your voice sound like when it's time to get everybody in the car? Supervisors, do your employers generally see you as somebody they want to work for? Those are good things for us to think about. They're challenging. God has given most of us some kind of authority, and we can put his character on display when we function in the same way that David functioned, on whatever scale or whatever scope God gives us. Another point of application for us is to ask ourselves how we respond when we see success 
in our position of authority. God grants success and he grants it again, like authority, maybe in small measure, maybe in large measure. How do you respond when you succeed? David, for 10 chapters, has done really, really well. It's a good example for us. So things are going really, really, really well for David. What can possibly go wrong? Well, chapter 11 is, is what goes wrong. So let's turn there to chapter 11. We're going to look at an overview of the character qualities King David put on display in his sin. First was his success. Now we're going to look at what he demonstrates in his sin. In chapter 11, I really like this word. I heard this word eight or ten years ago. It's a hinge. It's kind of the hinge between the first half of the book and the second half of the book. And the first verse is a continuation of success. You see this. More success than it happened in the spring of the times when kings go out to battle. We're going to get there. David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. So everybody's out of the house. Look at what they did. They destroyed the sons of Ammon. These are the guys that hired the Arameans. David comes in and says, you can't handle me with the Arameans. You can't handle me without the Arameans either. They besiege a city. But what did David do? He stays back at Jerusalem. So God's hand is continually on David here. More success, more and more and more. David has no reason to believe that God will be unfaithful to his covenant that he made back in chapter 7. Chapter 8, chapter 10 is filled with massive success. And this is where everything changes in the course of David's reign. And you see it in four verses, uh, verses 2 through 5. You see David's sin with Bathsheba. First of all, you see David's pride. This is the character quality that David puts on display. He puts his pride. He stays back at Jerusalem. We don't have a reason why. He doesn't list that in Scripture. But we know he wasn't where he was supposed to be from verse 1. At the time when kings, that would be King David, is supposed to be out in battle. So there's David's pride. I don't need to be there this time. I can put this one on autopilot, and this is just going to work. It's in the wheelhouse, and it's going to go. Verse 2, when evening came, David arose from his bed, and he walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. David is basically browsing the internet at this point, and he comes across an attractive website. The next character quality that we see that, that is characterizing David in his sin is discontentment discontent. Verse 3, so David sent and inquired. He thinks he needs somebody else. He already has at least six wives. Those were the ones that he had women, uh, children by in Hebron, and he had more wives in Jerusalem. He's discontent. Clearly, he isn't thinking about what he should be thankful for. He's got all these other wives. One of them was Abigail. She was beautiful. And in verse 4, you see covetousness coming into play here. So David sent messengers and he took her. Because David didn't flee from the situation, he exposed himself to the greater, greatest danger that there is. And that's his own flesh, his own coveting, cannot be satisfied flesh. And then in verses 13, oh, sorry, 6 through 13, you see another characteristic that comes into play, and that's David's deceit. This is his first attempt to cover his sin. He thinks he could make the child look like it was Uriah's child. And the lesson there for us is we think we're deceiving others, but we're actually deceiving ourselves. God tells us your sin will find you out. Wouldn't everybody know that this child was David's child? It doesn't look like Uriah. It would look like David. And you see in verses 14 through 17, David's second attempt to cover his sin. We find that he succeeds in removing Uriah from the picture, but he doesn't necessarily cover his sin, and we'll see that in chapter 12. There's more pride. He thought he could make it look like Joab died in battle. He thought making it look like Joab died in battle would, would solve his problem. I've got this great idea. I'm elevating my thoughts of what I should do here above what God tells me that I should do. He knew what he did. He knew what Scripture tells him to do. He didn't do that. He thought his own design would be better. And he followed that. 
So the story unfolds and he has Joab put in a place where, or sorry, Uriah put in the place where the fighting is the most fierce and he has all the other men withdraw. And Uriah, with all the skills and abilities that he had, he can't withstand all of the forces that are against him and he's killed in battle. But you see indifference that David displays in verse 25. A messenger was sent back to David to give him the report of what happened. He's going to send the messenger back. And David said to the messenger, thus you shall say to Joab. David had already given instructions to Joab on how to do this. Now he's telling him, tell Joab this, do not let this thing displease you for the the sword devours one as well as another. The sword devours one as well as another. David is trying to chalk this up to the ebb and flow of war. And Joab himself knows that it's not the ebb and flow of the war because he received instructions from David contrary to the ebb and flow of the war. But David's indifferent. He's trying to make it out like it's no big deal. A woman has just lost her husband. And we need to remember that the Lord was guaranteeing David's success in all of this. Go back to the covenant. I'm going to give you rest from all of your enemies. So this idea of it being the ebb and the flow of the war doesn't really fit with God's covenant to David. David is almost acknowledging that he's stepping outside of his participation in the Davidic covenant. This won't help David maintain a great name. This won't help maintain a place where Israel will not be disturbed. At the end of the chapter, Bathsheba mourns the death of her husband. David makes her his wife, and she bears a son. Chapter 12 the child dies. We're going to come back to chapter 12 when we look at repentance. What we're going to do now is we're going to move through the rest of the chapters fairly quickly. But the important thing for us to remember here is that all of this goes downhill, and the reason why it goes downhill is because of what just took place in chapter 11. Chapter 13, we have David's oldest son, Amnar, and he lusts after his half-sister, Tamar. He's got the same kind of desires for his half-sister that David had for another woman's another man's wife. Tamar's brother Absalom hates Amnon for raping his sister because Amnon goes in and rapes his half-sister. But David does nothing about this. David does nothing about this, and this is where his indifference comes into play. Verses 15 to 23, David does absolutely nothing to reconcile what's happened between Amnon and Tamar or what's happened between Amnon and Tamar's brother Absalom. And it's implied You can read this between the lines. It's not actually stated explicitly in Scripture. Absalom must be exceedingly frustrated over his dad's lack of involvement in Amnon's life here. So Absalom takes it upon himself to have Amnon killed, and he flees to another country. He flees to the country of his mother's father. Chapter 14, David brings Absalom back after three years. He's gone for three years, and the man who's been speaking to him into his ear this whole time has been his grandfather, who is the grandfather of Absalom, but not the grandfather of Amnon. So there's no blood relationship between this grandfather and Amnon. So he doesn't have any concern for helping him because it's not his family. You can only imagine what the council looks like to Absalom. Chapter 15, Absalom starts a practice of winning the favor of all of the people. And he does this by heading out to the city gate, and deciding cases for the people, very favorably for those people. And so what he's doing, he's gathering all this support for these people for himself to become their king. And he becomes their king. They they make him their king. And David flees Jerusalem. David flees the, the city of David. Chapter 16, And when David flees, he flees to the east. He eventually ends up crossing the Jordan River. And Absalom is strengthening his position. He's becoming more and more strong. Chapter 17, Absalom pursues his own father to kill him. Again, this is the result of what happened back in chapter 11. God made promises to David, and we'll see that. But this is where Absalom's pride gets the better of him. Um, Hushai is one of the, the counselors, and Hushai says... You know that your father and his men, they are mighty men and they are fierce like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is an expert in warfare. Absalom should have taken the clue there, but he didn't. He was all in at this point. He was fully committed. And so chapter 18 rolls around and David's men actually end up capturing Absalom. 
And it's good for us to read how this happens because there's a lesson here for us. Here's a man who has, like David, he was gaining in his support like David did some years before. And everybody was behind him. He's a very attractive man. He's got this great hair. Yeah. But I wouldn't have his problem, so that's good. Absalom is riding on his mule. We know how this goes. The mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak because he has this head of hair. And so his hair is entangled in the branches, and he is hanging between heaven and earth. He's just dangling, and the mule kept going. So he's hanging there. Verse 10, Joab took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak tree. So the result here is several things have taken place. Um, you have one daughter who has been raped. Amnon raped his half-sister. The reason for that is that when he was growing up, David probably didn't cultivate healthy relationships between his children. He was busy doing other things. But his first priority was to his marriage. His second priority was to his children. And then after that, whatever else came after that, ruling a country and conquering the Philistines came after that. But he didn't do that. Clearly, he didn't do that. And so he has a daughter who has been raped by one of his own sons. Amnon himself is dead. Absalom killed Amnon. And Amnon was dead. Absalom himself is also dead. And all of these are tied back to David's sin. As God promised David, there will be violence in your household. So the consequence here also, if you look at verse 7, you drop back to verse 7. In this battle between Absalom's men and David's men, the people of Israel were defeated there before the servants of David, and the slaughter there that day was great, 20,000 men. So there's the loss of three family members and 20,000 soldiers, probably on both sides. So in chapter 19, David returns to Jerusalem, and now you can see the distrust that Joab has for him. We'll read verse 5. Joab came into the house of the king and he said, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all of your servants who today have saved your lives and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and your concubines. And the reason why Joab is saying this is because David was mourning the death of Absalom, the one who wanted to take his life. David is mourning him and Joab is saying, You have covered the faces of your servants with shame. Verse 6, You've done this by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, then you would be pleased. So the trust has fallen out of the bottom with Joab here. That's another one of the consequences of David's sin. This would not have happened if chapter 11 hadn't taken place. Then you see there's strife between Israel and Judah in verses 41 through 43. We'll read this as well. This is very helpful. Behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why had our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over the Jordan? Then all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative to us. Why then are you angry about this matter? Have we eaten at all the king's expense or has anything been taken for us? But the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king. Therefore, we also have more claim on David than you. Why then did you treat us with contempt? Was it not our advice first to bring back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were harsher than the words of the men of Israel. So you have the, the 10 or the 11 tribes, and they're in contention with, with Judah. So here's David. He's got this kingdom. He's got this nation, and they're fighting within one another. It's not just within his own household, but it's the whole nation is fighting Judah against everybody else. So the unity in the kingdom is starting to fail. And again, this is Israel. Their, their task and their mission was live a holy life before me and then put on display to the rest of the world around you what it looks like to live in a right relationship with me. But they weren't up to that. They couldn't even get it right with each other, much less get it right with God. And all of this, again, is because of the discord that, that happened is because of what David did in chapter 11 with, with Bathsheba. Chapter 20 is the last example, and we see that, again, there's another rebellion. There's a man, Sheba, and he leads the northern tribes in rebellion against David. 
And so Joab again is here. He's ready with all of his violence. And he besieges this city where Sheba is holed up. And the people in this city know that they're done for if they don't give over Sheba. So there's some negotiations. There's a woman inside who has some wisdom. She has some nerve. And they arrange for the, the head of, of Sheba in exchange for the retreat of the army. And that's what takes place. That's kind of the last story of what happens in, in the kingdom. So here you have, again, the northern kingdom, the tribes that will become the northern kingdom, fighting with David in the southern kingdom. So you have all of this discord in David's household. You have the loss of family members in David's house. You have all of these things. Uh, and then you have the kingdom itself starting to fall apart. But we want to look at two character qualities here that are very helpful that we need to see for ourselves. And it relates to character qualities that David put on display in his repentance. So we're going to go back to chapter 12 and we're going to take a look and see what happens. And we know that, that the first one of these character qualities that he puts on display is blindness. Here's Nathan. Nathan comes to David. We all know the story. Nathan tells him the story of the rich man taking the poor man's ewe, the poor man's ewe lamb. There's a traveler coming by. He stays with the rich man. The rich man has lots of sheep and the poor man only has one sheep. And so he takes the sheep from the poor man to feed the traveler. Verses 5 and 6, David's anger is burning against the rich man. David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. God had guidelines in the, the five books of the Old Testament that when you steal a sheep, you have to return them 4x to the ones you need to repay them with four times the amount that you took. This is several months after David's sin with Bathsheba. Nathan comes to him. And David can't even see himself in this story. And if he does, he keeps it well hidden. And there's where deceit is in view. But if that isn't in view, what's going on here is blindness. He can't even see him himself. He has to have it pointed out for him. So the application for us is, how often are we on others for their sin without checking ourselves to see if that same thing is in us? Um, earlier this year, I had a chance to take a good look at Matthew chapter 7 and how important it is to get the log out of your own eye first. To make sure that your own eyesight is clear so you can address something in somebody else's life. David here isn't able to see his own sin because of his sin. So verses 7 through 15, you have to give high marks to Nathan in this. Nathan doesn't walk away and doesn't say, well, good effort. Nathan tells him, you're the man. No, this story is all about you, and I'm bringing this to you. You're the king. You've had all this massive success. You can do whatever you want. But here's Nathan, and he says, you're the man. Verse 13, David demonstrates the fear of the Lord that he had demonstrated in past years with great degree. Here he says to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. He knew right away that he had sinned against the Lord first and foremost. Yes, he absolutely sinned against Uriah. He absolutely sinned against Bathsheba. He entered into that marriage. He wrecked that marriage. He wrecked that family. But he knew first and foremost his sin was against the Lord. Psalm 51, we all know this. I'm going to read the first four verses of Psalm 51. David writes this, Be gracious to me, O God. I need grace here. I have no merit before you. Be gracious to me. According to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. He's acknowledging that his transgressions are there and he can do nothing to remove them himself. He needs God to remove them. They can't be removed on his own. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He knows he's guilty, and he knows his guilt has tarnished him and made him exceedingly dirty in a way that he cannot clean himself. Cleanse me from my sin. He knows it's all about his own sin. It's not a mistake. It's not a poor choice or whatever else. He knows it's his own sin, and he knew he did it, and he knew he was responsible for this. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. He's acknowledging that that the Holy Spirit has, has let him know and let him understand the, the depths of his sin. He sees this. 
against you and you only I have sinned. He's saying the scale of my offense against you is like this compared to any other offense against anybody else. And the offenses against others are great. But the offense against God for all that God is and all, all that God has done is massive. So it's against you and you only I have sinned. and I've done what is evil in your sight. This is good confession. This is good repentance. He's acknowledging exactly what he is, what he did. And he's acknowledging how God sees it. I know you see this as evil. I've done what's evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and you are blameless when you judge. David is looking at God's perfect, righteous, holy standard and that God executes his judgment on that standard perfectly. And that's what biblical repentance is. It's recognizing who God is and who we are before him, how dirty we are before him, how much we need his grace and his kindness. And so for us, let's make sure that we, we never lose sight of that. Let's make sure that every time we need to go before the Lord, we are characterized by the fear of the Lord when we're confessing our sin and repenting from it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for the story of this, this good king. Lord, thank you for the testimony of those first 10 chapters of when a man is faithful and he is humble and he is holy. Lord, that you are good and kind and faithful. Lord, there is peace, there is progress. Lord, your name is put on display. Lord, I pray for us. I pray that we would be people who are very mindful of ourselves and mindful that our greatest enemy, our greatest danger, our greatest threat is within us. It's our own hearts. Lord, would you grant us the grace we need to recognize and perceive and discern ourselves rightly? Oh, Lord, we are in this mixed condition today, the believer. Lord, you tell us in your word that the flesh sets itself against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and they are in opposition to one another. Lord, I pray for us. I pray that your word would be richly dwelling within us so that we could contend with our flesh, with the power, the authority, the truth, the permanence of your word. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.